Hey YouTube, what's up? Mike the Manic Geek here. Now today, we're going to be finally, finally taking a look at the Gigabyte Z170 Gaming 3 motherboard. Now this is their entry level Z170 platform board that provides you with all the overclocking and tuning features of the Z170 chipset with a price point that makes sense for a lot of budget conscious gamers out there. So without further ado, let's finally get into this motherboard, take a look at it, and talk about what it was like to actually use it. All right, so we're switched to first person view now so I can actually see the record time for when I go over these products. <laughs> now I'm also not using the other table because it's a mess from another review. Um, this motherboard has a pretty standard complement of stuff that it comes with, uh, but in particular, we've got this G connector breakout uh, connector here that you can use to hook in your uh, your case IO uh, meaning your power reset and activity lights and such and then plug it right into the motherboard slot right there without having the connector sticking out too far and making the whole process to set it up that much easier. Uh, you also get uh, your standard complement of SATA connectors, uh, which in this case have this uh, clear shielding on the outside so you can see uh, the actual uh, insulation on the inside of the cables, which gives it a silvery look. And frankly, I think it looks kind of nice with the, uh, with the silvery accents on the motherboard. Getting on to the main event here. Uh, you want to notice the black and red color scheme here. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of that, but whatever, that's all in the eye of the beholder. The area immediately around the, uh, the CPU socket here is fairly clear of, um, of anything that would interfere with most CPU coolers out there, so you're probably going to be fine there whatever CPU cooler you use. We do have 8-pin uh, uh, EPS 12-volt power here, as well as five fan headers for the board. So we got one there. We got CPU Opt right there, which is what you would use for an all-in-one uh, water cooler pump. You have your main CPU fan header here. You have uh, SysFan 3 here, and then you have SysFan 2 down here. This does employ a seven-phase uh, VRM power delivery system for the CPU, uh, which does use Vichet RA18 MOSFETs. Um, they're pretty good MOSFETs, and I actually found during my testing with this board that this power delivery was more than enough, at least as i5 overclocking goes. Now the heat sinks here are uh, aluminum. They do have uh, sort of a, a hollowness to them. You get down close to them. Um, these clips, uh, I wish they would have been uh, screws instead of just the spring retained clips, but they do stay pretty firmly in place and they do a really good job of cooling actually. Now the other cool thing here is these heat sinks are interchangeable with their positions. So even if you wanted to leave them just as they are, you could uh, flip flop them around and have the Gigabyte logo over here. Or if you wanted to do some custom coloring or painting on them or whatever, then you can set them wherever you want. It won't matter. Just make sure you got fresh thermal pads there. Uh, we have our four DIMM slots here for dual channel DDR4 memory. Uh, we also have two USB 3.0 headers here, which is really nice for anyone that has a USB 3 powered um, bay mounted peripheral or something like that uh, to really make use of, of that plus uh, case IO as well. So really like that implementation. Uh, <clears throat> SATA connections, we've got uh, six over here. They are, um, they also double as SATA Express. Uh, not really certain why they went that route because there's all of like two or three people on the face of the planet that actually use the one SATA Express device that may be rumored to exist. Moving down, we have our three PCI Express by one slots, as well as three PCI Express by 16 slots, which are physically wired in as by 16, by eight, and by four. Now, if you're running SLI or Crossfire with this, which this motherboard is certified for both, see? Uh, then you will be limited to by eight and by eight, using these two slots. This one, I really, I wouldn't really recommend using that. Now, the cool thing about these slots here, at least for the time 16 slots, is they have this um, ultra durable armor that's on them that increases the rigidity of the socket. And actually it does a really good job um, of not only making the socket itself more rigid, but it does a good job of making sure that you can actually minimize GPU sag. Like even when I put my GTX 980 on this motherboard, I found that I've never seen the card sit this straight before. So I really like this implementation here. I like seeing it soldered directly into the motherboard. And uh, yeah, it's just a really clean implementation overall. Now we do also have 
uh, two uh, M.2 slots here, and these are socket three, so they run off of PCI Express lanes. So you can get some pretty blazing fast speeds out of those slots, as well as being able to uh, run RAID with them as well. Just make sure you check the motherboard manual uh, with how to do that based on the M.2 drives that you're using. Now, <clears throat> this little guy right here is your Turbo B clock controller. Now basically what that's supposed to do is it's supposed to uh, give you an effective base clock range of as low as 90 megahertz or as high as 500 should your chip be able to overclock that high. Uh, the chip that I used for testing here could not uh, really achieve those results, but uh, it's a nice feature to have if you like messing with base clocks. Uh, we also have our killer E2201 uh, NIC installed here. Uh, really clean uh, internet connection during my use of this motherboard. I didn't find that there was any sort of instability or odd packet loss occurring. And I also found that the software that was included with this was actually pretty, um, was pretty straightforward, pretty easy to use, and the, the interface was very responsive. Uh, so really, really good implementation with that here. Now working along the side, we see the isolated uh, uh, circuit trace here. Uh, for the audio solution, which in this case is the amp up audio solution as they are terming it. Now this is using the Realtek ALC1150 audio codec in conjunction with this uh, Texas Instruments Burr Brown OPA2134 op amp, which is socketed. So if you want to mess around with different op amps, you can go ahead and, uh, and remove that and replace it. Uh, now these are also using uh, Nichicon capacitors uh, so really high-end componentry here. Uh, we also have uh, these four dip switches here, which are used for controlling your audio gain, either 2.5x or 6x. I wound up moving this back to 2.5x, and in testing the audio solution with my Corsair Vengeance 1500 headset, I actually found that the headset sounded about as good as it's ever sounded before. So uh, really good job with the implementation here. Now, as you can probably guess, this trace does also light up. It lights up in red. So uh, either within the BIOS or using the uh, app software that, that uh, is supplied through the Gigabyte website, uh, you can change this to either a solid color, you can have it breathing, you can turn it off entirely, or there's also a pulse mode where it, uh, it sort of pulses with the, with the song that you're playing. Um, wasn't really able to test that functionality as it appears to not work with USB uh, powered audio solutions. Uh, I think you need a three and a half millimeter jack. I will update this with, um, with uh, some little text right here or something like that if I find out anything different after this video goes live. Now, <clears throat> before we move on to something like rear IO, uh, I do want to finish uh, covering the rest of the motherboard headers here. So we do have two USB 2 headers. We've got some common TPM headers here for those of you that are still rocking the legacy stuff. And we do also have an internal Thunderbolt header here sandwiched between these bottom two slots, which will enable you to put in a gigabyte Thunderbolt expansion card so you can also get Thunderbolt connectivity on this motherboard. Flip around to the side over here. Uh, we do have all of our rear I.O. Uh, we've got our, our combo PS2 port for a keyboard or a mouse. We have USB 2.0 ports here, which are actually also used to power uh, an, amp, uh, an external USB DAC if it doesn't have its own external power source, which is really nice. And you can turn that functionality off if you do have one with external power. Uh, also got D-Sub and DVI here. Two USB 3.1 ports, one being type A, one being type C. Three USB 3s, HDMI out. Uh, we've got your RJ45 network jack here and then your obligatory audio outs here. So let's talk about what it was like to use this motherboard then. Now, unfortunately, for those of you that followed me on Twitter, I got extremely frustrated with this review as a result of some camera issues that I was uh, encountering based on how I was filming at the time. So I lost a lot of my footage of me physically using the board. However, I did complete all of my testing on this board utilizing an i5-6600K and 8 gigabytes of uh, Crucial Ballistic Sport me memory that was uh, on loan to me from uh, Brian over at uh, BPS Customs. Brian, thank you, thank you so much for loaning me that processor. You did me 
a massive solid man seriously i really appreciate that and guys you should definitely go over and check out his channel if you haven't already and check out the content that he's got there but as far as actually using this board is concerned i had a really easy time with it actually now that's saying something considering this is the first time i've ever used a skylake platform and i really didn't have any hands-on experience beforehand but the bios i found was very intuitive very easy to walk through and very easy to find for the most part, all of the settings that you would need to have a top-notch tuning and overclocking experience using Z170 and Skylake. Now, the one thing that I was a little concerned about here was the F6 BIOS, which is the newest BIOS release on the Gigabyte website. Using that on this motherboard basically made it unusable. Uh, I kept on getting post loops, I get boot loops, I would get the computer randomly powering down. Nothing I did to it would correct it. Now, rolling back to the F5 BIOS corrected all of these functionality issues that I had, and the motherboard worked fine from there. Your results may vary, but based on my experiences, I cannot recommend the newest BIOS for this motherboard. If you have known stability using the F5 BIOS, I would go no newer than that. So what was it like to overclock using the Z170 Gaming 3? Well, to be honest with you, it was pretty straightforward and pretty easy. The BIOS is a little intimidating at first because it offers, I almost feel like more functionality than is actually needed for a product like this. But that's a good thing because as an entry level motherboard is concerned, that allows your experience to grow with the platform. And as you learn how to tweak and tune more things with your processor and your memory, you'll get more out of it as time goes on. So your system will continue to grow with you, which I really like in a motherboard. Uh, overclocking again was very straightforward. Just set load line calibration to high, dial in your multipliers and your, and your voltages, go through and test and everything was rock solid. I experienced no more than maybe 0 0.02 volts of V-droop under maximum load using the high LLC setting for this. So really strong power delivery, really strong overclocking potential. In fact, the i5-6600K that I used for testing on this board did achieve its maximum overclock setting of 4.5 gigahertz at 1.31 volts on the core. I tried pushing for 4.6, uh, but I was noticing that the chip really wasn't having it, even with shooting ridiculous amounts of extra voltage into it. And even Gigabyte's auto-tuning software that you can download through their App uh, Center program did attempt to push this processor to 4.6 gigahertz, but um, it, you know, it, it just wasn't staying stable no matter what I did. Now that being said, even as far as auto-tuning software goes for this, it actually got really close to the max overclock for this processor that I used here. So that's actually something that I might consider using just to give yourself a sort of plus or minus 100 megahertz frequency buffer of what your processor is actually capable of given your current hardware configuration, including your CPU cooler as well. But at the end of the day, guys, I definitely have to give my Manic Geek thumbs up to the Gigabyte Z170X Gaming 3 motherboard here. This thing is super feature rich. It gives you way more functionality than the motherboard this cheap deserves to give anyone. It was an incredibly stable and enjoyable experience once I got the right BIOS installed. And really everything just sort of fell into place. I can even reconcile with the black and red color scheme here because there really isn't a whole lot of red that's actually on the motherboard, so it's a bit more subdued. So even visually speaking, I really enjoyed this motherboard and I can't wait to get some Skylake hardware that I can call my own so that I can actually build a system with this. But anyway guys, that's gonna wrap it up for this review for right now. Uh, go ahead and give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down like you do how you do. Share this video if you feel like someone else might find it useful. Also, subscribe if you haven't done so already. I've got some more content that I'll be working on in the near future. While you're at it, hit me up down in the comments below. Let me know what you thought about this motherboard. Also, if you've used it before, what's your experience been with it? And have you been able to get the F6 BIOS stable with your hardware configuration? If you did, hit me, hit me up down there and let me know uh, what your specific configuration was and if you've had any other issues with this in the past. But anyway guys, until next time, take it easy YouTube.